our next speaker is Sister Bethany Madonna. Um, Sister Bethany entered the Sisters of Life in 2007. Um, she's a native of Florida. <laughs> and she also graduated from UCF. <laughs> Um, she currently serves at the community's mother house and serves with the novices. Um, she loves spreading the good news and um, working with young people. A fun fact about Sister is her favorite movie is The Sound of Music. <laughs> um, let's all give a warm welcome to Sister Bethany. I'll start off with a little story. I want to share. I remember uh, my first eight-day silent retreat when I entered the convent. Uh, my retreat director, he asked me to spend the first hour of meditation on Hosea 2.14. I jotted down the scripture, got the verse all right, we set a time to meet the next day, and I was off. So I went to the chapel not knowing what to expect. I just knew that I was gonna commune with the triune God. <laughs> so I sat down, reverently made the sign of the cross, cracked open the word, invoked the Holy Spirit. The prophet Hosea, chapter two, verse 14. Now in Father's translation of the Bible, that verse read, I will allure her into the desert to speak to her heart. It's beautiful, right? Romantic even? In my translation of the scriptures, <laughs> it was a little different from Father's. That same verse in my Bible said, I will lay waste the vines and fig trees, of which she said, these are the higher my lovers have given me. I will turn them into rank growth, and wild beasts shall devour them. <laughs> so I'm like, say, what? <laughs> oh my, I'm like, lay waste vines and fig trees? I'm like, what's with the false lovers? <laughs> Is there a second book of the prophet Hosea or something? <laughs> so needless to say, I became very worried about the rest of my retreat. Um, with the devouring wild beasts and everything. <laughs> and uh, I decided to be faithful to what was asked, and I sat there for an hour. <laughs> and the Lord, um, who is so faithful, uh, began revealing to me areas of my heart that were really tangled with vines and uh, lies I really believed about myself and places within me that were not bearing fruit. Um, that he wanted to devour. And I realized in that meditation, you know, my God is jealous for me, you know? He loves like a hurricane and boy was I the tree, like swinging around. <laughs> um, so when I met with my director the next morning, father was horrified by the discrepancy. <laughs> uh, but I tell you, uh, that one verse laid the foundation of my retreat and laid the foundation of my entire year. And it was no mistake uh, that the Lord acted in that way. So I thought maybe we could begin this talk on prayer with a prayer, if you'll join me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the most powerful intercession of your beloved spouse, Blessed Virgin Mary. Overshadow us. Protect us. Open our hearts that we might receive all of the graces the Father intends to bestow. We entrust ourselves to you. Blessed Mother, be a mother to us. Help us to give our yes as you did. Help us to bring Jesus joy to his heart, consolation. Help us to follow him. We pray all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, who saves us and makes us new. Amen. Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So prayer, according to the catechism, is God's thirst meeting our thirst. So God thirsts that we might thirst for him. That's what he desires. During the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, 
It's a feast that expresses joy in the providence of God from their time in the desert to the present harvest. And there's always a water drawing ceremony during that feast. The high priest with everyone in a procession singing goes and draws water from the pool of Siloam and then pours it into a basin in the temple because water is our sustenance and water is a representation of life. Well, we read in the Gospel of St. John that Jesus was in Jerusalem on that feast. And he said something very bold. I quote, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he exclaimed, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. He said this in reference to the spirit that those who came to believe him in him were to receive. So come to me and drink. It reminds us of that conversation that he had in the heat of the day by a well. Jesus asked the Samaritan woman, would you give me a drink? Give me to drink. And when she asks how she can do that, he replies, if you knew the gift of God and who it was asking you for a drink, you would ask me for the drink. So if you knew the gift of God, prayer, prayer is this gift of God to us. Prayer in Jesus, he's given to us. Jesus is in the Father. Jesus is in the word, the scriptures. Jesus is in the Eucharist, on the altar, and in the tabernacle. Jesus is within every baptized soul, yours and mine. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus says to the Father, where I am, I want them to be. He wants us to be with him. And we have to marvel at the humility of God, the humility of God to thirst for us. Um, one evening we had a guest come to our convent and he was a four-year-old named KJ and he wasn't Catholic, but he insisted on praying night prayer with the sisters in the chapel. And although he didn't know our chant, he sure knew how to hum, which was very impressive. And at the end of the night, uh, the lights were down, the candles were being extinguished, all but one candle, the red tabernacle candle. So KJ leans over and whispers, to the sister next to him, I love when little kids whisper because it's actually louder than their regular voice. <laughs> you, you know, their, their mom's like, whisper, like, okay. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> you know, you hear it at mass, they're like, are we gonna get donuts? <laughs> Is it almost over? <laughs> you know? So, so everyone in the chapel heard this conversation uh, and KJ whispers, hey, what's that red light for? And sister is recognizing that he is not Catholic and is very, treading very lightly. And she said, that light means Jesus is here. This is his house. He's here. Oh, made perfect sense. <laughs> so then he looks back over the altar and he goes, hey, what's in that gold box? You know, now sister's at a crossroads because she's like, okay, do I open up John 6? <laughs> Transubstantiation? My flesh is true food, my blood is true drink? No, I'll be simple. She's like, well, that's where Jesus is. That's where he lives. And KJ stands on the kneeler, forgets to whisper and goes, do you ever take him out and look at him? <laughs> To which sister replied, yeah, for an hour every day. <laughs> wow. We have a God who, who not only lets us take him out and look at him, uh, but he lets us receive him, receive him into us, within us. I mean, it is so humbling. St. Francis of Assisi used to come before the Lord in prayer, and he would ask these questions. Who are you, most sweet God, and who am I? And I think that's the stuff of prayer, you know? 
Who is this God and who am I that he would become a man for love of me, you know, to forgive me of every sin, to remedy every fault and failing, to strengthen me on my journey home to the Father's house? Who is this God who shares his heart with me? Who is this God who suffers with me? That he would want a relationship with me. You know, I marvel at the personalities of Jesus' apostles. It's very consoling. Uh, one of my favorites, though, and very little spoken of, is Nathaniel. Nathaniel is one of the apostles who I really have grown to love. Now, when Philip goes to retrieve Nathaniel, he tells him, we have found the Messiah. And Nathaniel's a little cautious. He's like, where'd you say he was from? <laughs> yeah, anything good can come from Nazareth, you know? Um, he was a little uncertain. And when Jesus sees Nathaniel approaching him, he looks at him and he says, here is a true Israelite. There is no duplicity in him. And in, the, in a Jewish context, that's high praise. You know, in any context, it's like saying, you know, there's integrity in you, and I see it. Now that, that made Nathaniel wonder. And he asked Jesus, how do you know me? Now, Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, through whom all things were made, I have to believe that the Lord had to pause and smile in this moment. How do I know you, Nathaniel? <laughs> Nathaniel, I know you from within. I know everything about you. I know when you sit and when you stand. When you were being fashioned in secret, I was there, you know. Before there is a word on your lips, I know it through and through. Your thoughts are not far from me. All of your ways are known. I know you, Nathaniel. And Jesus knows each one of us like this. He knows us from within. He knows why we act, and he knows why we react. You know, he knows everything that's going on inside. And far from disturbing us, uh, this should give us a great sense of relief and peace I don't have to explain myself to God. I don't have to try and find words. The very same God who set the bounds of the ocean, who created the stars and put them in their courses, the one who created the warmth of the sun, the illumination of the moon, whose very thought became the coral reef, you know, became Niagara Falls, the very God who, who, who made up orangutans, and peacocks, and giraffes, and dolphins. Um, the one who made the hydrangea flower. You know, it's like a thousand flowers in one flower. It's the size of your head. <laughs> I love that flower. This very God made you. He made you. Every human person is made in the image and likeness of God. And that's not some stamp in an assembly line. You are given, you are given a unique reflection. You express something unique of the mystery, of the glory, of the beauty of God that was entrusted to you, chosen for you. It's an incredible reality. Each and every one of you, more stunning than the beauty of a sunset, really. He gave us immortal souls, and then he invited us to share in his very blessed life by way of grace. Um, we have these infinite longings in our hearts, and we can all relate to them because they're not satisfied even by the best things of the world. We'll have an incredible experience, a wonderful day, a beautiful conversation, and we'll, we'll be left wishing there were more, even with a hint of disappointment. We have infinite desires, and God gave them to us because he wants to fulfill them. I mean, if you think about the creativity and the mastery of God, the intricacies and the complexities, um, the care and the detail that he used in making each and every one of us as we are, how can we begin to open ourselves up to this reality that God loves me? God loves me not, not because of my potential, uh, not because of my good behavior. God loves me not because he owes it to me or I deserve it. God loves me for me.
that question of St. Francis of Assisi, the second one, you know, and who am I? It's one that we bring to prayer. And I want to tell you a story about uh, some friends of our community, Matt and Lucy. Now, Matt was healthy, outgoing, active. He and Lucy fell in love. They were engaged to be married. They're just one of those shining star couples, you know. They shine like stars amidst a perverse and crooked race. You were like, yes, Matt and Lucy, renewing marriage and family life. It was awesome to see them. Well, before their wedding, uh, Matt was diagnosed with cancer, and it was terminal. And um, they put their trust in God, and they proceeded with their marriage, and they canceled their honeymoon so that Matt could begin his treatment. Now, they were told to uh, contracept, to do anything not to conceive. They, were, they did not know how the doctors were advising them all kinds of things, saying, we don't know how his treatment uh, will affect his fertility. They did conceive, and they conceived their first son and were pressured to abort, terminate the pregnancy. Uh, we don't know what will happen. We don't know what will happen to this child. They were very fearful of fetal abnormalities, um, you name it. But Matt and Lucy refused. They put their trust in the Lord, and they asked their family and friends to pray. Pray for this little one. Um, pray for us. Pray for our strength. And all of the friends and family did, and they awaited the day of the birth. Now the baby arrived, and after his delivery, scooped up and inspected by the doctors. And he did have one birth defect. Um, his two fingers in the middle of his hand were fused to his palm like this. <laughs> Does anyone know sign language? Yeah. This means I love you. So the child was born with his hand like, yeah. I love you. And Matt and Lucy knew that it was a message from heaven, that their trust was being honored and that they were loved deeply. Now, I love St. Paul because he goes crazy trying to put into terms for us that God loves us. He's like, you don't know about the height and the depth and the breadth and the cubits and the kilometers and the pounds. And there's so much to say. He's like, he loved himself and gave himself up for me. And when Paul says that, you know, it's singular. And that's true for all of us. Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us in a singular, particular way. St. John says, we have come to know and to believe in the love that God has for us. We may know it, but to believe it, you know, to live out of this reality that I'm a beloved daughter or a beloved son of the Father, whose fatherhood is unfailing is unwavering, is incomparable. That's who I am. And I remember realizing this for the first time, this relationship that I had with God, that he looked on me with this way. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, I, I wanted to check out the party scene, you know? You, I had the FOMO, fear of missing out. So it was like, you know, I'm going here and there and everywhere. And I realized uh, very soon uh, that this is not my scene. You know, the, the regrets of Monday and the, the darkness, and I, I'm, I will not spend my time in this way. And I received just a conviction of that, and I made a little vow to myself that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at the party scene anymore. So one night, my junior year of high school, that carried me through several years of high school. I'm out with my friends. We're, we're over at a friend's house. We're getting ready for a night on the town, you know, mall, movies, hit Baskin Robbins on the way back, get a pint of something, come home, talk for hours on end. <laughs> you know, in the middle of the night, you're like just starting to wrap up, and then somebody goes, hey, did you ever think about... <laughs> and then like an hour later, you're still going strong, and then you're like, guys... Anybody? <laughs> They're all asleep, heavy breathing, surrounds you. Maybe it was just my experience. Uh, but it was one of these nights. And so I'm out with my friends. We're getting ready to go out. And a phone call comes in. And, you know, parents are out of town, keg party. Are you all in? Are you in? So these are my best friends since sixth grade. They, they look at me. They're like, we're totally in. I was like, oh, you know, when your stomach, your conscience, I don't know where your conscience resides, but mine is in the pit of my stomach. And, and it's very much like Pinocchio, you know, like, always let your conscience be your guide. So they're like, are you in? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, I'm out. They're like, what? It was like everything was slow motion from that point. I'm like, take me home. 
So we got in the car to go home because I was trapped. I didn't have a car. So it was like the longest, most awkward car ride, like crickets, you know, no talking at all. You know, you could cut the tension with a butter knife, you know, and I got out of that car and I, I really, I always claim the grace of my confirmation because I said something that no one in their right mind would ever say to their friends at that point in high school. And I said, do I need to find a new group of friends? It was like, no. <laughs> it was like echoing, you know. And they looked at me and they looked straight ahead and didn't answer. And I was like, wow. <laughs> so I closed the door and I walk into my house. And if my life were a movie scene, like this is where the billowing clouds come in, like the darkness. <laughs> You know, suddenly I'm soaked out of nowhere. It's <laughs> I walk in, my mom's like, you're home early. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> right to my room, you know. Go to my CDs, saddest CD I have. <laughs> saddest song on that sad CD. Repeat. <laughs> you know, lights out. I lay down on my bed. And I just let the death of my social life wash over me. <laughs> like an ocean. <laughs> it was pretty clear that I would, I would die an old maid. Friendless, loveless, I mean, yeah. It wasn't long though, after receiving the peace of that moment, that I met a whole new group of friends. You know, uh, guys who were clean cut, funny, wholesome, uh, girls who understood me, we went to the beach together, mom, movies, everything I wanted. And they took me on a retreat, these friends, and I was in front of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, having one of these Francis of Assisi moments, like, who are you and who am I and what do you want from me? I had an experience that wasn't in the realm of feelings, but in the realm of knowing without knowing how, that God knew me and loved me and was hearing me without me speaking. Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to tell her novices, go into the chapel and say, here I am, Lord, love me. But we don't love the consolations of God. We love the God of consolation. Discouragement is always to be rejected and is not of God. Absolutely no one can love God with the love of your heart. He has given you a unique love and he desires it and he seeks it and he asks you for it.